Last week, we talked about a process by which we could start designing nudges to change behaviors in specific domains. What I'd like to do now is to give you three examples of recent papers that have been published that follow the process in coming up with some three interesting nudging ideas. In particular, the three nudges we're going to talk about are enhanced active choice, reminders, and finally, form designs to get people to be more honest. Let me start with the first one. It's October in Canada, and it's flu season. And in fact, it is flu season in many parts of the Northern Hemisphere at this point in time. And every time the flu season comes around, you often see messages like this asking you to go to your nearest clinic and get a flu shot or an injection to prevent yourself from getting the flu. Most of us don't get a flu shot. And the question is, how can we design an intervention to get more people to protect themselves from the seasonal flu? This was work done by Poonamanan Keller and her colleagues at Dartmouth. And what they were doing is they worked with a company that had an annual flu program where if you did indeed take a flu shot, you not only got protected from the flu, but the company gave you an incentive of $50. Under that circumstance, even then, there were a large number of people that did not get the flu shot. What Poonam and her colleagues did was they experimented with three different ways of asking people whether, in fact, they wanted to get a flu shot. What are the bottlenecks in the decision to get a flu shot? Bottleneck number one, it's not an active decision. You see the information. That's not the place where you get to make a decision. And then life gets in the way, and you forget about the choice. Bottleneck number two, when most people think about the decision to get a flu shot, the benefits of not getting a flu shot are salient. But the benefits of getting the flu shot seem to recede in the background. Poonam and her colleagues tried to correct for these deficiencies. Every time participants in that particular organization got a message about a flu shot, they were then presented with a, with a card or a, or a questionnaire that asked them for their intention to get the flu shot in a standard opt-in condition. They saw the message. They had to check a box which said, yes, I want to get a flu shot this fall. In a choice condition, they were given two options. They could check either, yes, I do, or no, I don't. But here's the most interesting version of the questionnaire. This is what is called an enhanced active choice. And it said, check one of the following. Yes, I will get a flu shot to reduce my risk of getting the flu and because I like the $50 incentive. Or no, I won't get a flu shot this fall because I don't care about my risk of getting the flu and I don't care for $50. So what's happened here is the way in which you frame the question makes the cost of not getting a flu shot salient. It, it, now, if you actually see this question frame, you would have to convince yourself that you're completely irrational to not get the flu shot. What did they find? Here's what they found. Is people that saw the standard opt-in condition, 42% of those folks did express a desire to get a flu shot. When, in fact, it was converted into a yes-no active choice, that number went up to 62%. But the kicker is when, in fact, they had an enhanced active choice, when the number went up to 75%. So the idea in this paper is simple, is making the choice salient, making it active, and highlighting the cost of the bad choice changes the outcome. Here's a second example, reminders. We've talked about the fact that all of us have good intentions, but we forget to do simple things like take our medications or pay our bills on time or make contributions to our retirement accounts or renew driver's licenses. An experiment that was done by Dean Carlin and his colleagues in three different countries, uh, they looked at the Philippines, uh, Peru, uh, and Bolivia, uh, reminded people from time to time using interventions as simple as text messages or simple letters in the mail to remind them to make contributions to their retirement plans. What these researchers found using a randomized control uh, approach in these three different experiments was that simply sending reminders increased savings by about 6%. These researchers also tried other things through the reminders. They tried making the reminders specific and concrete, reminding people what their goal was, framing the message as a gain versus a loss. And what they found was that to the extent the reminders are specific and they remind people of a very concrete goal, in fact, that savings goes up by 16% and not just 
6%. So simple reminder served as a nudge. Uh, the bottleneck here was the fact that the decision was passive. The reminder made it active. Here's a third example, and this is work done by my colleague Nina Majar and some of her collaborators. And what they were studying is the idea that most of us are uh, a little bit dishonest. We are not outright liars, we don't want to cheat, but we fudge numbers once in a while. So for example, when you write your tax returns, we tend to overstate expenses. What they did was they had participants come into a lab to do, a, to, to, to do, to do an experiment. Uh, and at the end of it, participants had to actually report how much they think they have earned in that experiment uh, using a form like this one. It looks pretty much like a standard tax form. Participants wrote their name on the top. They wrote down uh, a bunch of questions, uh, which asked them about how much they had worked and the effort they had put in, and therefore to price the contribution that they had made to the experiment. And then they signed at the bottom saying that everything they had written up here was true and honest. So you notice the signature happens at the end. What Nina and her colleagues thought was when, in fact, people respond to this questionnaire, the perception of themselves as an honest person, as a good person, is in the background. Could we somehow bring it to the foreground? Could we make it more salient? And they did exactly that by using this version of the form. Looks pretty much the same, except that now you see the signature panel is at the top. So people write their name. The first thing they do is they sign and say that everything I'm going to say from here on is honest, is true. And then they go on to report all of the numbers, pretty much like they did in the first version. What did they find? They essentially found that the, uh, the rate of cheating declined dramatically. And in fact, the data showed that 39% of people cheated when in fact they signed at the top, whereas as many as 79% cheated when in fact the signature was at the bottom. So here we have three examples. Three examples of simple nudges. And what is common to all three is the idea that the nudges were simple to execute, they were relatively inexpensive, but most importantly, they were scalable. It was fairly easy to test something in the context of a small experiment, but you could easily change forms or easily send text reminders or easily change the way in questions were asked to change behaviors at a fairly large scale.